nuclear bomb. The emergency broadcast system is is at its at its wits end. The bombs are dropping. They're coming from all around us: China, Iran, North Korea. Barbenheimer is already nearing a year old, and ever since the release, I keep seeing a lot of Robert Oppenheimer content. And I've done a bit of research on my end. I've read the books. I've seen the white papers. I've experienced the human pig chimeras myself. Barbenheimer brought the origins of the world's most powerful weapons to the forefront of the minds across the globe. Nukes are back in style, baby. Whether you regard Oppenheimer as a cinematic marvel with its breathtaking shafach, or a slog to get through because it's so fucking long, regardless of that, it may have stirred within you a conspiracy. Today we're talking about nuclear conspiracies. To help reduce you to a state of constant panic about a hypothetical doomsday scenario you have no ability to control, we now present The Onion Explains Nuclear Proliferation. And by the way, I would like to make it clear that someone told me in a previous video when I referred to an atom bomb as a nuclear bomb that atom bombs weren't nuclear bombs. Do you know what fission is? Do you know what happens? within an atom when it's in a nuclear bomb? It doesn't sound like you do, Chumley from Pawn Stars. It probably wouldn't surprise you that there is no shortage of conspiracies in regard to nuclear weapons. Would it? Would it, guys? There's conspiracies everywhere. I myself love a good conspiracy or two, but today we're putting on the thinking cap. We're gonna be talking about a range of different things in this video. By the way, there's some crazy fucking theories out there. For example, nuclear weapons just don't, don't exist. That's a theory, nuclear weapons don't exist. Or the theory that there are 100 missing suitcases size nuclear bombs following the collapse of the Soviet Union. I've got one of them. The conspiracy that nuclear weapons are not real. This is a theory that falls into the same vein and category as some other wild speculations from fringe online communities and people who belong in those communities who just distrust the government to such an extent that everything that is a mainstream, whether it's purported on by the media or something that the government leads us to believe. It's just the opposite of that is true. So in this case, nuclear bombs, nuclear weapons are not real, okay? The most attention that this theory ever got was when Big Bear, Owen Benjamin. I'm, a, I'm six seven, I'm not a tall man, I'm a fucking bear. Posted online, on Twitter, of course, a video of doom towns getting blown apart with a caption suggesting that these tests were fake. I remember seeing this. I remember seeing this on Twitter. I don't know why I saw Owen Benjamin's tweet. Big Bear is a bit of a wild card. He was pretty normal like f eight years ago, something like that, but he was on Joe Rogan's podcast and he ate too many Death Star edibles and then he lost his mind or that's the, that's the official mainstream government theory. Owen says that he just woke up and you know he's against the matrix and all that stuff i wanted to talk to you about social media okay because i i love you <laughs> i love I you too i think you're a very good guy i really do but you are the worst representative of yourself on social media i'm a bad it's, lawyer it's, it's myself a, it's a bad form of getting out tricky ideas doom towns if you weren't aware were built within the blast range of nuclear tests in the 1950s probably seen the videos of them they're very cool it's incredibly impressive it's it's Ridiculous. I mean, well, that looks like Nuketown from Call of Duty. That's because it's the inspiration of Nuketown from Call of Duty. Especially the mannequins positioned throughout the town. That is a massive callback to the real life Doom Towns. Inside the buildings, workers positioned entire families of mannequins who silently waited for the explosions to come. In these Doom Town videos, the houses are being absolutely vaporized, but the cameras are not. The cameras that are filming this are not. And Owen states, Nukes are fake like it's a fact, as well as the bombs that fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They, they weren't, they didn't, act, it didn't exist. And that is because there was no fallout radiation. Here is his tweet. It's weird that nuclear blasts vaporize brick houses, but not the old tiny camera recording it. It's because nukes are fake. Hiroshima and Nagasaki never had any fallout radiation. The whole narrative and all the evidence is absurd. That is 27 million fucking views. Holy shit. Now this semi-recent tweet from July of last year is probably the most relevant and notable thread highlighting the argument for nukes being faked. It isn't the most logically sound, to be honest, but it has been viewed 27 million times, so pretty impressive. It was also bookmarked by 3,000 people, so 3,000 people thought it was compelling enough to bookmark it. <laughs> With how many people were replying to this, most of them just saying he's an idiot and that he's wrong, he decided to leave a nice list 
of replies or responses to just basic arguments. NPC shit, right? Some people were saying that the camera is far away, but alas, no, it is not super far away as suggested by some of those idiots because the camera is in, engulfed in a dust cloud and there is also one shot in which the camera is in a house so he disproves that claim oh and then says the camera is not being protected by a bunker and that anything that could vaporize brick could also vaporize any protective shield that might be containing the camera to capture these shots even though there are examples of these bunkers that were constructed for cameras during the Trinity test, for example. It's important to note that when users called this out and talked about the specific bunkers that the cameras were situated in, he didn't reply to them. He replied to himself and talked about bunkers in those threads to himself. So this is what they were in. I believe this is the real story. I don't know if this is, I feel like nukes are real. Why would they lie about that shit? I feel like you gotta really think that the earth's flat in order, in order to think that nukes aren't real, which I think Owen does believe that, to be honest. Owen's next point is that all these are miniatures, which is a pretty convenient excuse, considering the scale of the destruction you see on the footage, which looks nothing like miniatures to me. I, I've seen the, there's like videos on TikTok that have been going around some kind of effect forget what it's called, but it's like you blur out two parts and hyper, hyper sharpen it and saturate it and it makes everything look like a miniature and it fucking makes me, dude, it makes me rock hard. Not really. I don't know why I said that. It is weird though. It is weird. You can just make stuff look like miniatures, but these don't look like miniatures. For example, this shot of the explosion, there's a lot of material here. Look at all that. You couldn't make that into a miniature. I feel like little, little, like toothpicks and shit wouldn't like that when they're flown into the air. I, I don't know that. I feel like the whole thing would just blow away. If you could recreate all that dust and everything on a small scale, I don't know. Maybe you could, but I don't know. You, normally you can tell when something's a miniature, like in movies, old movies. This does not look like a miniature to me, but I, what do I know? I'm not an a miniature expert. Owen also claims that there is no fallout in Hiroshima or Nagasaki or any of the US testing sites that have conducted nuclear testing. Now, I don't know if this is too broad of an argument, but the CDC website, if you believe that sort of three-letter organization, claims that pretty much everyone in America has received some dose of radioactive fallout from the nuclear testing in the 50s and 60s, or anyone who's been alive since 1951, basically. Basically, everybody's received some sort of fallout radiation from it, and it has increased the risk of cancer for some people. So I say we, we conduct a lawsuit, large class action lawsuit against Edward Teller and Robert J. Oppenheimer. Oh wait, they died in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s or the 80s or the 90s? I don't even know when they died. Honestly, I don't give a fuck. Maybe they're still alive. If they are, I'm coming to find you. All right. Other evidence that exists proving nuclear fallout or nuclear material existing is found in wine testing, believe it or not. You can actually tell how old a wine is by testing the levels of radioactive carbon in the wine. And you know, how, since there's half-lives there. There are even some California wines that contain the radiation from the Fukushima power plant that flooded and was destroyed a couple years ago. Japan will soon begin the process of releasing radioactive water from the tsunami wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. Owen's next point is that Hiroshima and Nagasaki weren't even in the top 10 most destroyed Japanese cities in the war. I don't know, he's watching some fucking watch mojo shit. I have no idea. By the way, there's also a reasonable explanation to this if you just take a minute to research it. Before the use of atomic bombs, we still had bombs. In March 1945, the RAF produced the 10-tonner, the Grand Slam. On the 15th of March, Lancasters used them to attack the viaduct at Arnsberg, one of the main exits from the Ruhr. And we would bomb the shit out of people, especially the Japanese. We really loved strategically bombing the Japanese. And they loved committing atrocities on the Chinese. According to this defense.gov, if you believe that type of thing, they detail the use of Admiral William Halsey's fleet sailing up and down Japan, attacking it at will, sending as many as 500 B-29s day and night, just bombing this shit out of Japan for a, for a lot of time. Apparently, opposition was minimal. Whatever the fuck that means. Hey man, we're sending the nukes. A lot of towns were completely destroyed and even Tokyo was hit with incendiary bombs from over 325 bombers. But Japan still didn't give up. It took the use of god powers, basically, to make them quit. Around 67% of Hiroshima was destroyed, and thanks to the geographic location of Nagasaki, the hills surrounding the town, 60% of the, the, the city was protected from the blast, 40% was completely destroyed. There's a World War II database that has a list of 67 cities that were conventionally bombed in World War II uh, on the Pacific Theater, and they have a percentage of area destroyed from 12% all the way up to 99% with 
11 cities exceeding the destruction of Hiroshima, 67% and 45 exceeding the 40 percent destruction of nagasaki and face all that destruction japan still didn't surrender it took dropping nuclear bombs on them to get them to throw in the towel big bear owen benjamin claims that one of the men working on the manhattan project said that it was just a massive amount of tnt that they used like for minecraft a fella galen windsor whose name he cannot spell right. Only piece of information that we could find about Galen Windsor even talking about TNT in regard to nuclear bombs is a clip of this. Plutonium has been assessed as being the most hazardous material on Earth. Now, from the standpoint that you can make an atomic weapon out of it, yes, it is quite hazardous because a piece of it that big two and a half kilograms, only five pounds, is the force that delivered 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent over Nagasaki. I mean, if you listen to this and then you said that, you, you like interpret it in the way that he, that's ridiculous. Final point is that it's possible for the whole world to be in on it considering the existence of the United Nations. I mean, that doesn't really make sense because like China has nuclear bombs, Iran has nuclear bombs, North Korea has nuclear bombs. Russia has nuclear bombs. If that theory is true, then every world leader basically with a country that doesn't like the United States or, or you know, has any form of power have just all agreed to not discuss the fact that nuclear bombs are not real for some reason. I don't know what that means. I mean, maybe to keep people in check, I'm not sure. They're still big bombs. I mean, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. We've seen footage of them exploding, like the SAR bomb. On October 30th, 1961, they pushed the limits of explosive power further than they'd ever gone or will probably ever go again. This bomb was codenamed the Tsar. It contained the equivalent of 58 million tons of TNT. Nuclear bombs don't have to exist for there to be bombs that are scary as shit. I mean, come on, people. What's wrong with you? And both Hiroshima and Nagasaki have museums dedicated to their respective blasts, showcasing the horrors that people went through, such as the man, the shadow of the man on the wall or whatever that is, the thermal thermal imprinting, I forget what that's called. So now I hope we're all under the impression that nuclear bombs were in fact real, that they are something that exists in the real world and that the damage of them is horrible and scary. Because if you don't believe that, the next conspiracy, it's not really even a conspiracy, this is actually true, is of missing nuclear bombs. Have you ever seen the movie Broken Arrow? What a rush. That was my favorite movie of all time. I used to pretend that I was a spec ops, green beret, cag fella running around trying to find a missing bomb, trying to de deactivate it and stuff. Pretty cool as a child. The main broken arrows that exist on Earth today are the six missing United States nuclear bombs, the missing 100 suitcase sized nuclear bombs from the Soviet Union. This is all from Vice Black Market Nukes documentary thing. Vice makes some pretty cool shit sometimes. We'll link it down below. We did an article in the magazine about a French journalist who went to Bulgaria and bought a warhead on the black market. We were so fascinated by this that we decided to fly to Sofia and research it ourselves. Anyways, it's nothing new for any sort of superpower to lose large amounts of ammunition, especially the United States. We're kind of known for misplacing things in regard to defense spending, you know, especially if you talk about the Pentagon misappropriating funds just before, you know, 9-11 or something like that. I really don't know, Warren Commission. I'm not really sure. We love leaving shit behind though, miss losing shit, you know, you name it. I mean, look, we left the Middle East a couple years ago. We're probably going back now. I I think we're actually already back. We are back, baby. We are fucking back. From World War II, there's a bunch of bombs and stuff and ammunition and artillery and shells that never went off buried in the hills of Europe. A massive bomb dating to World War II was exploded in the English city of Exeter. The one ton munition was discovered the day before by builders. Bomb disposal teams detonated the device. The blast was heard five miles away and threw debris nearly a thousand feet. So how do you lose a nuclear device? Well, I imagine it's the same of anyone losing anything. <laughs> like a cell phone or a wallet or a key or something. I imagine it's not much different. You know where it is one moment and then the next you don't. According to the epic source that is Wikipedia, there are 13,890 nuclear warheads in the world. This is down a lot, like 50,000 from the 1980s at the peak of the Cold War. Allegedly, there are partially dismantled or, you know, undestroyed, potentially intact weapons of mass destruction sitting in garages, hangars, or worse, 
even in the hands of people who want to sell them. Just around the world, there's people with bombs. In this Vice documentary, we mentioned at the beginning of this section of the video, they talk about nukes being on the black market. They meet with a guy who has access to a nuclear bomb. What the fuck? To him, there's no difference between making Beverly Hills condos on the Black Sea and selling warheads because it's all just capitalism. So it's just buying just and selling. Out in the open doing like normal business now. Yeah, so he, definitely. Is. Where's he keeping it? In his mom's garden. Vegetables uh, in one garden. 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 Well, we said, where's the bomb? And he said, oh, I, I buried it in my mother's garden. The idea of nuclear bombs just being able to be had by random people is, is pretty scary because it doesn't just devastate people. It's not like a weapon, a normal weapon or a car. You can just take a car and drive it off. It irradiates an environment. It's a different thing. It's fucking bad. And you cannot argue with that. For example, a dirty bomb going off in Manhattan, which I have no plans of perpetrating that, would ruin New York for decades. The chances of getting cancer would increase like 100% day by day. Obviously, nobody wants to get cancer, so they leave. You can't come back for another 30 or 40 years, and you can't clean it up. So you know, New York ceases to exist. By the way, this Bulgarian dude with a nuclear bomb in his garden wasn't just a, a rumor starter. This actually is true. The ex-vice director of the Soviet atomic program, a fellow by the name of Fedor Pachinko, verified its authenticity. So they brought in Fedor Pachinko who was the ex-vice director of the Soviet atomic program to verify that it was real. And finally, he told that this is crazy. Even though this video was uploaded 11 years ago, this is a testament to how easy it is to potentially get things that are massively devastating and horrible. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. I feel like that's, cr that's crazy, right? I mean, that's insane. Guns are one thing. This is like another level of insane. This is like God level. This is, this is playing God, really is what it is. Now, as an addition to the broken arrow aspect of this video, I will tell you about the 1958 Tybee Island mid-air collision that led to the misplacement of a Mark 15 thermonuclear bomb. A bomb that was lost near Tybee Island near Savannah, Georgia due to an in-air collision. Two B-47 bombers were flying around on training missions from the Homestead Air Force Base in Florida when they collided in mid-air and dropped a bomb on just in the ocean or some shit. Both of these planes, for some reason, were carrying these nuclear devices to simulate what the planes might experience and how they would handle, etc. And it's the whole point of training. But why are you training with bombs, with actual bombs, in America? Why not just train with a couple sacks of feed? The crew of those two planes flew for more than 10 hours over the United States before they had to refuel over the Gulf of Mexico. A bit of time after this, they activated the electronic signal that is meant to imitate the dropping of their bombs, their payload, over their target, which was Savannah, Georgia, or around that area. All part of the training, baby. All part of the training. After the training exercise was completed, they were on their way back home to Florida, but around 2 a.m., the next morning, the B-47s met three F-86 aircraft who were on their own training mission. One of them collided with a B-47. How the fuck is that possible? The F-86 pilot ejected from the plane safely, just in case you were worried. <laughs> but the B-47, however, lost altitude and plummeted from 36,000 feet to 20,000 feet before control was regained. In doing this, the B-47 crew requested that the payload, which was a thermonuclear device, be jettisoned. That means shot out, eliminated, excreted, pooped, okay? They shit out the thermonuclear device so it wouldn't accidentally explode upon an emergency landing. So shitting it out, what the fuck's get that gonna do? Isn't that gonna, maybe they're gonna do it with a little a little thing, a little, little parachute? I'm not sure. Their request was approved for some reason and the device was dropped at approximately 7,200 feet. The B-47 landed successfully at the Hunter Air Force Base south of Savannah, Georgia. The bomb, however, was never seen again. The bomb has been missing since 1958 when a B-47 bomber collided with another plane. That B-47 dropped the bomb into the water near Tybee Island before landing at Hunter Army Airfield. This was to avoid the possibility of it detonating upon the aircraft reaching land. Duke says the government only spent a couple of months looking for it. There is a debate as to whether or not this bomb was fully operational or was a dud, but rescue efforts to locate the bomb have been completely unsuccessful. So we like it could have gone off. It, this is how just dumb the American military and government is. They're not always dumb, obviously. Playing with nuclear bombs above a city of people and then dropping one and then not 
not being able to find it. Are you all crazy or what? A short time after the training exercises on February 6, 1958, a disposal squadron and 100 Navy personnel equipped with handheld sonar were on the search. They were unsuccessful. This search party ended two months later on April 16th, 1958. No outstanding effects have been recorded from the dropping of this nuclear device. I don't really know, but if it did have a plutonium trigger on board, it could have been a massive, insane catastrophe that would have changed the very face of America, especially in the, the Savannah, Georgia region. One man is still adamant that the nuclear device is still out there. If it's still there, do you think a hurricane might unveil it one day? Oh, absolutely. The good news is Duke is convinced at this point the bomb is in a safe place, possibly buried deep in the silt. And another adamant man on Twitter is is adamant that there is no nuclear devices at all. His name is Owen Benjamin, and he's a big bear. The conspiracy aspect of this comes in when the rumors you learn about that other countries had found it. But Derek Duke, the guy from the video, states that it's definitely still at sea. It's lost at sea, guys. Thank God. It's insane that a bomb that could bring death to hundreds of thousands of people is just lost and then disappear and now it's in the sea. Hey, let's go find it. Let's go make a video and find it. By the way, this type of thing is nothing new for the United States and it's not the first or it may be the first time they've done this, but it's not the last time it happened twice. Ever heard of the swamp nuke? Of course you haven't because you're normal. On January 4th, 1961, a B-52 Strato Fortress was flying around and there was a fuel leak on its right wing. Okay, I don't know why this is a thing that's happened more than once. This is fucking insane. This bomber specifically was a part of a covert operation known as Airborne Alert, which involved maintaining over 12 nuclear armed bombers armed and ready 24 seven in case of an attack. By the red commies out there in the Soviet Russia. Refueling efforts for one of these B-52 Strato Fortresses were canceled due to there being a fuel leak and they were told to continue a flight pattern over North Carolina. It was intended that they would eventually find a safe spot to land but the fuel dump was a bit faster than they had calculated for it dumped 37,000 pounds in three minutes which is a lot I don't even know how many pounds of fuel a b-52 strato fortress can fucking hold but 37,000 seems like a lot the bomber was instructed to land at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base that is a real Air Force Base by the way not a uh, non-tendre Seymour Johnson you know penis see more penis but the aircraft approaching 10,000 feet and preparing to land uh, began to shake violently the death rattle as 60 owners would call it the crew decided to abandon ship and they bailed from the aircraft somewhere around 8,000 feet in altitude the bomber caught fire and there was an explosion the spiraling aircraft broke up between 1,000 and 2,000 feet over the farming community of Barrow about 12 miles from Goldsboro North Carolina by the way, they did abandon their payload as well. What was their payload? Oh, only two, three to four megaton Mark 39 thermonuclear bombs. The two MK-39 bombs were sent free falling to the ground. Each MK-39 is cylindrical, measuring just under 12 feet in length and weighing between 9,000 and 10,000 pounds. They're built to lay waste to a wide area. Individually, the bombs have an explosive power bigger than 3 million tons of TNT. Are you, did you think Russia was going to invade and then you're gonna drop bombs on our own country? This makes no sense. The two bombs were dropped at around 8,000 feet and sent into a free fall. These bombs were fucking massive, by the way. They were 260 times more powerful than the explosions uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One of the bombs had its parachute deployed and its safety mechanism succeeded, allowing the bomb to have little to no damage. However, the second bomb did not have its parachute deployed, and it essentially just dropped into the earth. The United States of America at 700 miles per hour, crashing into a swamp and breaking apart. The United States at the time, as you probably could expect, downplayed the incident heavily. However, years later, it was admitted that the bomb that parachuted almost went through its four-stage cycle. Oh my god, dude. Though the U.S. downplayed the incident at the time, many years later, declassified papers revealed the truth. Each of the M39 bombs were equipped with four interlocking safety mechanisms, all of which had to be triggered to explode the bomb. On the bomb that landed intact, three of the safety mechanisms had been activated during the fall. Only a single switch prevented the bomb from detonating. A single low voltage switch was the only thing that saved the bomb from fucking blasting America. The fate of the people of North Carolina saved by a low voltage switch. And after the accident, the army was sent to excavate the swampland to gather up the parts of the second bomb since it fucking blew up. Not literally, 
Well, kind of, yeah. It blew up. It came apart. The thermonuclear secondary component of the bomb, which contained plutonium, uranium, and lithium salt, was left where it lay, about 180 feet underground. Unlike other nuclear disasters, no concrete barrier was poured to encase the bomb. By the way, all they could gather from the destroyed nuclear device was the parachute, some high explosives, a tritium bottle, and a portion of the nose. They dug 40 feet and they realized it was a wasted effort because the rest of the device had sunk so deep into the, into the swamp and the excavation was just continuously filling with water because it's a swamp. That's what happens with swamps. So some plutonium, lithium salt, uranium, some shit is just out there. It's just out there, dude. Also, just in case you were wondering, the American government purchased this piece of land from the David family, which is the family who owned the land with a bomb dropped on there. Their property, they purchased it from, from them for $1,000 because of the material left behind. What a scam. The US government purchased a permanent easement from the David family who owned the land for 1000 bucks. A few years later, Congress voted to give the Davids family an undisclosed additional settlement. They're probably like, hey, yo, you don't have a choice. We'll drop a bomb on you, literally. Again, we'll drop it closer to your house this time. Thankfully, the bomb didn't detonate, and the United States is not currently in a nuclear fallout. Uh, thankfully. So it seems like we're all safe from blowing up, to be honest, guys. But uh, I'm not really exactly sure. There's a lot of cool nuclear stuff out there. There's that little, the the, the devil, the, the the elephant's foot. Why can I not remember the name of it? The little, the little, the little ball, the little thing that... Devil's Cube, the guy who got blasted with radio, I don't know, Chernikov radiation, I'm not sure. Oh, the Demon Core, that's right. I don't know, I just feel more unsafe now, to be honest, so sorry about that. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think down below.